We can start, people will be joining, but we can start with a little presentation of this last webinar of this amazing cycle of refugee welcome. Um, today, we will explore different experiences uh, of access to the education system in different European countries. We have the experience, uh, experience from Germany, from Sweden, and we have the experience of the Open Learning Initiative Olive at the Central European University. Thank you to thank you, thanks to all, all the speakers from these three institutions to share with us, exchange your, your activities, your, your um, projects, and your experiences. We'll start with Germany, with the experience in Germany, with Katharina Kube. Thank you very much, and sorry for my pronunciation. Um, I'm going to introduce her, and then she will have this 40 minutes for explaining the experience. And you can also, at the end of her presentation, ask the questions you think are necessary. Katharina, uh, she has been working as an academic advisor at, Te at Technische Universität Berlin. Sorry again for the pronunciation. I'm not good at, at, at German. Um, since 2014, and he, she's the head of the project in to, to Berlin, the guest student program for refugees. Uh, the program was developed by TU Berlin, answer to the refugee crisis in 20. 15 and 2016. It aims at facilitating and accelerating access to the academic system for students with a refugee background uh, by reducing bureaucratic hurdles. It has a strong focus on academic advising, uh, advising and guidance. In this context, TU Berlin also established internal guidance, guidelines sorry, for the recognition of what we can call atypical academic credentials and pave alternative ways to university admission. Uh, regarding this, I'm, I want to know how you're doing this facilitation of the bureaucratic processes and, and the guidelines for the orientation. So Katarina, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much, Kati. And um, yeah, the, the pronunciation was almost perfect. So no worries yeah. here. Um, <laughs> thank you. Um, yeah, um, you said I have 40 minutes to explain um, what we do and how we do it. Um, that really puts me under pressure. And um, I was really trying to, to keep it short. Um, so yeah, let's see how far we can get. Um, I will share my screen. Um, okay, I hope everybody can see something now? Good. Um, okay, um, basically I want to talk about two things. Um, I think it makes sense to uh, first of all explain a bit like or tell you some some words about Tubelin and explain a bit what we do um, so that you have an idea um, yeah, about also the context um, of our work. And then I try to briefly explain how academic recognition works uh, in Germany, which is um, a tough task, but well, I will give my best. Um, I'm glad that Peter Marok is here. He's um, my colleague um, and is an expert in academic recognition as well. Um, so please assist me if I tell something which doesn't make sense. Um, okay, now let's get started. Uh, TU Berlin, um, just to give you an idea, Technische Universität Berlin um, is one of the bigger universities in, in Germany. Um, there are four universities in Berlin and we are um, one of them. Um, on the right-hand side, you can see the campus uh, of TU Berlin, which is in the city west. Um, yeah, and as the name already tells, we do have a strong focus on natural sciences and on engineering, which might be one of the reasons why many refugees in Berlin were or are interested in studying um, at TU Berlin also. Um, I will um, give you some figures here later. Um, at the moment, we have roughly 34,000 students. Um, two thirds of it um, are male, one third female, which also might have to do with the um, subjects we offer. Um, we have seven faculties, um, as I mentioned before, with a strong focus on natural sciences and on engineering, um, but we also offer humanities and um, teacher training and also economics and management. So that's the 
that's the um, spectrum of what we offer. Um, there are two other big universities in Berlin, um, which do have a stronger focus on the humanities. So we are um, really the, the technical university in, in that area. Um, Almost 29% of our students have an international background, um, which is a lot for German university. I don't know what the pr proportions are in, in at your universities, but um, it's quite a high proportion. International here means that people don't have a German passport, which of course can still mean they might have German education certificates. So it's um, still a rather diverse group. Um, but it's quite a number. Um, we have all people coming from almost all over the world. There are 150 countries um, represented on our campus. Um, and most or, or the biggest groups come from China, Turkey, and India. And um, as you can see here, Syria is on place number four already. So that's quite a um, big number of students um, from Syria. And also re Iran is a big group. And yeah, then the other countries um, come on. Yeah, Ukraine does play a role now, of course, um, just to give you an idea. So there's really people coming from all over the world to, to Berlin. Um, we don't have a, we don't really have a good idea how many of them, of the international students do have a refugee background because we don't count that, of course, we don't ask people um, about their status when they enroll. Um, but if you count the, re let, let's say, relevant countries together, um, we can say that uh, roughly 10% of the international students do have a refugee-like background um, at TU Berlin, which, again, is quite a number. So if we, we, have, if we, if we have like more than 9,000 people coming not from Germany, then that would mean that there's 900 or something um, around that figure um, with a refugee-like background. Um, yeah. What kind of support do we offer for refugees at TU Berlin? Mm, to explain maybe what we do, I think it's, uh, it's important also to understand where we come from. Um, and that's maybe the the pictures you all have in mind when when we think about um the so-called refugee crisis back in 2015 and that was basically the point when we started to think about okay what could we do what could we offer for for refugee students um so there were many people arriving in berlin um on the right hand side you can see people queuing in front of the uh registration office um so well the berlin authorities are really infamous for not being that efficient and back uh, in 2015 they really um yeah it was that it was kind of chaotic um at some point <clears throat> of course we had refugees at the universities before 2015 but one big difference was that um people until 2015 they were not allowed to study um until their uh their asylum process was um, finished. So if they applied for asylum and their, their, their case was still being processed, they usually were not allowed to take up university studies. Um, it was really written in their passport. That's what you can see below, Studium nicht gestattet. So they were not allowed to study until um, the case was finished, which can take years. So people were basically really trapped in a situation where they couldn't do much. And that's why they also, um didn't really arrive at the universities um in 2015 um this rule was abolished um people got um the opportunity to study independent of their status um and that's when they started to also of course come um to TU Berlin and ask about their opportunities at the university um and we as the academic advising service are like the first point of contact for many um, students being interested in studying um, because, well, we, um, we offer advising and we, um, we offer guidance on how to enter the university system. That would, what we, that's what we did all the time. Um, now it was um, just another group maybe coming. We do have a lot of experience with international students, um, but still refugees sometimes are in a very special situation, which kind of also differs from what we know from 
let's say, let's call it regular international students. So we also had to adapt um, somehow to the situation. And then we started to think about, okay, what could we offer? Um, the first thing we, we could offer and what we still do and what is our main focus and what still really makes sense and is very important is the academic advising, of course. So what we offer basically are individual advising sessions, um, dealing with questions regarding access to the university, admission requirements, application, of course, of course, recognition of degrees and qualifications does play a big role here, um, especially for students with a uh, refugee um, background, because of course they didn't plan to come to a German university and sometimes they might not know about how um, or what their options are and how their degrees are being recognized here. Um, but as an academic advising service, we also try to focus not just on the bu bureaucracy questions, of course, we also, um, offer advice regarding choice of studies, a general orientation in the German educational system. Our job is not so much to, te to, 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 to sell our programs, but to really um, enable people to make a well-informed well choice about their further educational careers. Um, and then, of course, questions like financing, housing, and so on um, do play a role as well. Um, and that's what we did from the very beginning. So people basically come to came to our offices and ask about, okay, what can I do? What are my options? And in the beginning, basically we had to tell them, well, not so much um, because most of the programs are being taught in German. 100% um, of our bachelor's programs are being taught in German. And that means you have to learn German um, on a very elaborate level um, in order to get access to, to the university system. And that's where we started to think about, okay, is there other options or how can we, how can we handle this or what, can, what else can we offer? Um, because we met a lot of well-trained, highly skilled and extremely motivated people who wanted to do something now and who found it very um, depressing, of course, to, to, to um, realize that they had to learn German for, I don't know, a year, two years, and then um, could, um, could, could re-enter the, the university system. Um, and that's what we came up with um, was a guest student program. Um, that's what Kati already explained a bit. Um, so I keep it short. Um, what is the guest student program? Um, the idea is that students with a refugee background can register as guest students, um, even though they don't meet all the requirements yet. Um, so we try to really keep the the hurdles low. We don't require any official documents or any particular um, level of language skills because we try to see people as what they are as experts in their fields because most of them already started studying and already had academic experience. And we wanted to, um, well, bring them in touch again with their with their subjects, with their fields of studies. Um, guest students at Tubalin can attend regular courses from bachelor's and from master's um, programs, and they can also earn ECTS. Um, they can um, take exams already, and if they pass the exams and then later on become regular students, um, the credits can be recognized. And of course, they can also use the facilities of Tubalin. What is it good for? Well, of course, um, the program aims at um, getting in touch with the university again um, and also to, to readapt or to adapt to its learning environment, to understand the German educational system, and finally make a well informed choice about um, the further educational career. And of course, in the long run, to get access to the degree programs of TU Berlin and to, to finally um, earn official degrees and to become a regular student. Um, yeah, so that's the main thing what we do in the academic advising um, service. Of course, there's more things we offer. We also have language courses. We offer psychological counseling for refugees. We offer support for scholars at risk. Um, the colleagues from the international office raised an, a Berlin Ukraine aid fund um, to financially support um, students affected by the Ukraine um, by the war um, at the moment. Um, and there's more decentralized activities um, helping refugees to, to um, 
yeah, re-enter the university in a way. So that's just a brief overview of what we do because I think it, well, it's important to understand what we do and to also maybe what's our, to understand what's our approach to, um, to understand um, what's, what's the concept here. Um, okay, so that's Theo Berlin. Um, let's switch to the academic recognition part, which is the main topic of our um, session today. Um, I was trying to, well, prepare some, well, basic information on recognition in Germany. Um, and I uh, found it really hard to, to keep it that simple that it's really possible to, to explain that in, in half an hour. Um, so maybe, generally speaking, it's complicated, um, especially when it comes to uh, vocational recognition. There's so many. There's not one. There's not one central um, institution where you apply for something. You have to find out um, what's the equivalent um, um, occupation, and then there's um, many, many different um, uh, authorities to to address. Um, depending on in which field you want to get recognition. It's a bit easier when it comes to um, university recognition or academic recognition, but still what makes it complicated is um, that we have a federal system here and that, um, that like every German country, every German land has its own educational system and also its own kind of structures, of course, there's um, similarities and there's a, there's, um, there's a common framework, but it might differ according to in which country you are. Um, I try to um, sum up the basics um, regarding academic admission uh, recognition and how it works. Um, so the first thing is, um, academic recognition is within the re responsibility of the universities. Um, so we've seen, I think in the first session, we had this um, we had this presentation from Norway and it was like a very centralized um, structure where you could, where there's one office where you go and then you apply for getting things recognized. Um, if you're a refugee, this is not the case um, in Germany. Um, you, if you apply for the university, you don't have to get recognition from any German authority. You just apply with your documents um, at the university and then you get an, um, you will see what happens. Um, so or the university decides. So the universities are responsible for recognition aiming at undergraduate and postgraduate admission. And also of course, when it comes to transfer of credits um, within um, the university. Um, but of course they, there are um, there are common regulations and there are guidelines um, the universities stick to, so they don't don't just decide anything. Um, there's the Central Office of, for Foreign Education, which publishes recommendations for the evaluation of foreign higher education entrance qualification and academic degrees. Um, and the universities basically work with these recommendations um, and um, evaluate uh, foreign degrees according to what the Central Office for Foreign Education says. Um, but they have some scope of deciding. So that's important also to know. Um, these guidelines are being published, of course, also on the internet, so everybody can look it up. Um, unfortunately, the official website from the Central Office for Foreign Education is in German only, um, which makes sense. It doesn't make any sense, but it's only in German. And um, there's a translation um, from the German Academic Exchange Service. Um, there's an admission database where you can find this information also in English. Um, but I think the binding version is the first website I mentioned. So that's the really the basics. So there are common regulations, but the universities decide in the end. Um, I focus on I, I will focus on um, undergraduate admission now because um, I think that 
so it, it explains the concept um, very well and it um, would be maybe too complicated if we also look at masters. So let's stay with the undergraduate admission. Um, if you have, a, so the, the main idea is of course, if you have a, a degree or a certificate which entitles you to study in your home country, you will also be able to study in Germany and you will also get um, university admission usually or access to the university system. But it depends on the certificate um, how that works and which way or what what it looks like. Um, so there's basically two types of university entrance qualifications, um, the direct and the indirect university entrance qualification. Um, if you have a direct um, university entrance qualification, that means your school leaving certificate is comparable to what you get in the German system, then you can directly apply for bachelor studies and you can get direct access to the university. And then on the other hand, there's indirect university entrance qualification. That means um, your degree or your certificate is not 100% comparable to the German system. Um, maybe you, your school, um, you, you only went to school for 11 years. In Germany, it's usually 12 or even 13. Um, then you have to get some extra preparation. Um, you have to attend a preparatory school first um, and take an assessment test before you can enter the um, the university bachelor studies. So that's basically the two ways how it works. Um, just to give you an example, um, if you come from Ukraine, so that's the um, English uh, version of the admission requirements database. If you come from Ukraine, um, for instance, um, and you have the um, secondary school living uh, certificate from Ukraine, and you didn't study, um, then you have to do the preparatory school first, and then you can apply uh, for university studies. Um, if you studied already for one year, you have the direct access um, to the university. So that's so for Syrian certificates, it's similar. So if you have a Syrian um, secondary school leaving certificate, then you need a certain amount of um, of points in your, um, your in your final grade. You need um, seventy percent of the final grade. And then you have uh, direct access. If it's less than 70%, you have to do the preparatory school. So that's um, yeah, basically how it works. What does preparatory school mean? Um, it's study preparation for international applicants. Um, it's an institution which is usually um, kind of affiliated with the university, but not always. Um, it exists in every almost every German country. Um, so not every university has a preparatory school. Tübelin luckily has one. So that made many things easier for us because um, we have a preparatory school which offers um, preparatory courses and also exams. Um, but yeah, that's not the case at every uh, university. So we people come to Tübelin and then they take their exam uh, at Tübelin and then they are able to apply all over Germany. So um, that's basically the idea. Usually preparatory school takes two semesters, which is one year. Um, it's kind of in between school and university. It's organized like school, um, but it's not school in the sense that you have to do everything again. Um, you focus on your field of studies. Um, you would like to, um, you, the, the, the field of studies you would like to take up later on. Um, and it's yeah, subject specific preparation and German lessons. Um, you have to take an entrance exam um, before you can enter the preparatory school and you have to take a final exam. And if you pass the final exam, you're entitled to study at all German universities in the field you did the preparation in. Um, so that's what it's looked like. What it looks like, just to give you an example, like if you do the prep study preparation in engineering and natural sciences, you of course get um, you you have lessons um, in that field. Mm, yeah. So that's important to know. Um, I will explain um, the regulations at Tübingen later. Mm, 
What's also important to know about the application process, um, usually international students do not apply at the university directly. They apply through UniAssist, which is a platform or a working service point for international student applications. Um, what do they do? They kind of um, do a pre-check of the documents. Um, so if you want to apply at TU Berlin, for instance, you have to apply via this online platform. It's an it's an just online application. You upload your documents there. Um, you have to fill in um, all the questions. Um, and what UniAssist basically does is um, they check if your um, application is complete, if you handed it in the correct documents, um, and they make an evaluation of your certificates. So they check if it's recognized in Germany, if you have to do preparatory school or not, and they will also transfer your grades into the German grading system so that um, that the, the applications are being comparable. And then if everything is correct, they hand over the, the um, application to the university and the university decides who can get a place. Um, so, and this, that's, UniAssist is kind of a, um, is, is, um, tries to, to, to standardize things which are not so much standardized because the universities still, the universities still um, have their own processes. Um, and it's really challenging, especially for refugee students to um, apply through this platform because they, um, they process the, the applications in a very standardized way. And that means if you don't fit the system in a, in a way, you might get a rejection. So that's also something um, you, you need to know. Um, finally, the universities decide, but you have to get in touch with the university um, and know and, and find the correct contact persons there um, to do something. So yeah, that's, that's kind of also makes it complicated. Um, still, of course, um, it's a good idea to try to, to centralize um, that a bit because of course, um, UNISYS has more experience and is more, um, can, can, yeah, is, is more specialized in processing also um, international applications than maybe one single university um, might be. So yeah, but for refugees, it's, it's a challenge really. Okay, what happened then? Um, of course, um, you might know that, um, like if, um, if we are talking about refugee students, um, what could happen is that people don't have any documentation of their um, academic careers um, or that they don't really fit the system, which we found the bigger problem um, than like if there are no documentations, um, but yeah, I explain in a second. So what, what happens if somebody has incomplete or unclear documentation of his or her academic achievements? Um, then there's also state regulations, um, the standing conference of the ministers of education and cultural affairs um, published a um, guideline in 2015 how to deal with incomplete um, documentation um, and it basically um, and they basically said that there should be two steps um, what what we should do so if somebody doesn't have any documentation um, the first step should be that we should do a plausibility check um, of the educational biography um, so we should we, the universities again, um, should uh, try to find out, does it make sense what somebody tells, tells us? And then the second step, um, we should establish, um, well, examination or assessment procedures, um, which prove the competencies of somebody. Um, so that's basically the two steps. I think it works similar also in the um, other countries um, where we got presentations already. Um, what does that mean? So first of all, um, when these things were published in 2015, um, one, the, the, the big expectation like from, from, from politics was that 
many refugees would come without any documentation of their um, academic career. So that was the expectation that there should be many people who don't have any proof of what they did, um, which did not really happen. So there is a proportion of um, refugee students who don't have any documents, but it's not I, it's not the majority, of course, it's a small number of cases. Um, and as I said, what we found more challenging is there are many people who somehow don't fit the um, assessment or evaluation criteria because they didn't do or they didn't follow their academic careers in a way we expect that um, or the German authorities expect that. Um, Let's give you an example. Um, if you, I don't know, if you if you have a school leaving certificate from Turkey, um, you also have to take a university entrance exam before you can study in Turkey usually. And then, well, you go to the university. Um, but what happened, um, for instance, is that there were people coming who studied at military schools and universities, and they didn't need the university entrance uh, the university entrance test. Um, and they studied right away without this exam, but um, the German assessment system just doesn't know that case. So if you don't have the university entrance test, you might not get access to the German university system because we expect them to have that. Um, so that was an example where we had to find individual solutions. Um, and that is what we found much more challenging than if the the situation that there's no documentation at all um okay so how do we um how do we uh do this um how do we go along with these two steps um the plausibility check at tu berlin basically is what we do at in the academic advising so we talk with people and we see okay what's the academic background um what did somebody do so far which documentation is there so is it possible to get any um, documents or any additional documents maybe, um, and so on and so forth. Also, we try to see, okay, which equivalences are there in the German system? So is there an alternative option for someone? Sometimes um, it might not be the university. Sometimes there's other um, educational um, uh, careers that could make sense for somebody, um, which de degree programs would make sense. And then we also check the individual situation and see, is it really, so what is somebody aiming at and what should we do or what can we offer as a university? So that's what we can call a plausibility check. And the second step, um, when it comes to the examination or assessment procedure, um, we established um, a regular round table with the admissions office and with our, our preparatory school to discuss individual cases and to see, okay, what can we do here? Um, because there are some, there are some um, uh, cases where it's pretty clear if somebody doesn't have any documentation, he or she will have to take um, the entrance exam for the preparatory school. And then if he or she passes it, um, he can do the preparatory school. But then there's one thousands of um, other uh, cases where this regular rule might not really fit. Um, and then we have to discuss it with our colleagues. We try to develop guidelines um, along general inter internal criteria to make decisions also plausible, to not just um, have it as an individual case, but to be able to reproduce maybe these decisions if some, someone else um, would be in the same situation and try to develop best practice examples. We discuss individual solution um, solutions, um, yeah, and try to yeah try to find solutions that really make sense for people. So as I said, um, if somebody doesn't have any documentation, he will do he or she will do the preparatory school. What we also had is that someone um, said he had a bachelor's um, but didn't have any proof of his bachelor's um, studies. and we connected this person to the department. Um, it was the architecture department and that and 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 that um, example. and they, then created or did a bachelor's exam with the person. They um, sat down and talked and yeah, tried to find out if the person had the qualification you usually 
should have if you um, have a bachelor's degree. Um, and then the person got um, admission to our master's uh, program, um, which sounds easy, but it isn't because that's a situation where like everybody who is in charge somehow also has to use his or her, um, well, uh, um, decision-making, um, I, I don't know the, the word now. Um, so his scope maybe for decision-making um, because, well, the faculty um, needs to take some time and talk with the person. Um, the, the admissions office has to um, accept, accept the, 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 the exam and so on and so forth. Um, so that was one of the examples. Um, what we had. So the leading questions um, we ask ourselves um, here was always, did someone have access to the university system in his or her home country? And I think that's the main difference. If you, um, if you come from abroad and you really prepare for studying um, in Germany, you also have the information and you plan your academic career in a way that you um, fulfill the requirements here, of course. For refugees, that usually wasn't the case. So we, one of the main questions always was, um, is it possible for someone to continue his or her career um, now? And usually it's it's not um, the case. And then we saw, um, we tried to find solutions um, at Tubelin. Um, and also we try to, so in the German system, the focus really is very much on, on certificates. I, I would be interested in if it works the same way in Sweden and Spain um, as well, um, because we, we don't really look at the academic achievements of someone in the first place. We first of all look at what are the certificates and would, even if somebody already studied at the university, we would ask, okay, in our concept, would it be possible to get access to the university with this certificates? And if not, if we decide that, I don't know, the university entrance um, test is missing, then we would say, okay, no, you don't have access to the university, even though someone maybe might have been studying successfully for a couple of semesters. And we, in our discussion, try to turn that perspective around and try to focus on academic achievements first and then see, okay, how did someone get there and would it be possible to, to continue in the German system? Um, because obviously if, if someone was at the university already and studied successfully for, I don't know, two or three semesters, then it should be possible to, to get access to the system somehow. Um, yeah, I skipped that. Um, so what we found out is, um, as I said, it was easier to find solution if there's no documentations at all than if somebody doesn't fit the system. So that's really a big problem um, that people do have academic backgrounds that are not that we don't expect um, as uh, in in our system. Um, it's always individual cases, so we really try to establish rules, um, binding rules, general rules, but it's really hard to, um, to, to have a standard process because it's always, again, different and it's always different situations and it also depends on what people are aiming at and what they bring, um, so you always have to discuss individual cases. Um, I mentioned that before, all authorities concerned have to use their scope for decision-making. So that's important as well. And um, what we also found is that academic advising is essential because sometimes um, it doesn't really make sense to put a lot, a lot of effort in um, paving alternative ways of maybe the university or our degree programs are not the right thing for someone. So it's really important that you that people also have all the information and that we also um, look if there's alternative options maybe that could make sense. Um, because if you um, try to find individual solutions, you really also have to know what you are aiming at. Um, so that's why um, academic advising really was important in that, um, in that sense. So it's 
I, I, I had 40 minutes already. It's just one, one more minute. Um, so what we achieved is um, we, we've had roughly 150 students from Syria, Iran, Iraq, Afghanistan, and so on, taking up their studies at Jubilin each winter semester since 2016. Now it's more Ukraine, but there's not so many um, Ukrainian um, students who were able to take up their studies at uh, Jubilin yet, because of course they also need some preparation um, and German skills might not be that um, um, good yet, but it's uh, definitely coming. Um, we really try to focus on the academic ach achievements. Um, bureaucracy, of course, still is important. Um, you have to have a look at the documentation and at the certificates, um, but it also should make sense. And what um, what I also uh, found impressive or what's, what's one of the um, quotes I still have in mind, um, this is from 2015. And somebody said that as a refugee, you have a lot of termine. Um, that's um, first, basically the first word somebody learns if he or she comes to Germany. It's termine and it's Ausweis. Um, that's like really bureaucratic terms. You're very busy with handling things with the authorities and I would like to spend more time on my education and that's what we try to do in the academic advising service also to kind of switch the focus from bureaucracy and from documentation and certificates of course that's important um, but we really try to focus on what makes sense, um, what are your opportunities and what do you still need? And that's what the guest student program also is good for because it gives people time to organize themselves while they are already at the university. Uh, and that's what we are trying to do. Yeah, and as I said, the academic advising always really plays an important role here, even if we are talking about recognition, um, especially when it comes to the individual cases because it's to find solutions, it's also important that it really makes sense for um, the person concerned. Um, okay. So sorry, that was too long. I um, <laughs> I tried to keep it short. Um, I don't know. It was, yeah. it was very interesting, Katarina, and no worries because it's only three minutes past uh, 1940. Okay. So. It's on time, let's say. Um, I don't know if there are questions from the participants. Yeah, Ian? Well, yeah, I, I have seen oh. Ian because he raised her hand, but I don't I don't see the other people uh, that are with their cameras off. If you have um, questions, please raise your electronic hand, let's say. Yes, Ian. Yeah, thank you so much for the presentation. It, it was fascinating. I, I have two questions. The, the first is about, um, I, I, maybe I missed this, but I, I, I hope not. Like, if there are students outside of Germany, can they apply to uh, this program? Or is it only for students already in Germany or even already in the Lander system? Um, yeah. Um, yeah. It's more or less, it's more for people really already being in Berlin or in the area um, for several reasons. Um, the first reason, well, when it comes to the guest student program, of course, you have to be able to be at the university and to, to take part in courses and so on. So it doesn't make sense um, to be a guest student if you're not, um, if you're not here. Um, the other thing, when it comes to individual solutions, academic recognition, and so on and so forth, we found it really hard to, to um, or we discussed that um, also, like, especially in the Ukrainian context, like, what's the difference if somebody is here already, or if someone is still in Kiev and tries to apply and get a place at the university, but we really uh, made a clear cut here because it's, because, um, well, how can I, it's a political question in the end. Um, and um, how can I, that, that would mean that I have to, uh, that I have to decide if someone has a refugee-like background or not. You understand what I mean? Because, um, well, what I just explained, these like individual solutions are for, people with a refugee background and they also have to have a certain resident status usually we don't check that very um yeah we, we are not very strict on that but 
we say okay people have to be here and I and and to Berlin or studying in Germany has to be their only option because well if I'm if I'm not in um, Germany already I might have other options to continue my academic career elsewhere yeah so that's so yeah in short no it's for people who are in Germany already thank you it makes sense I was exactly thinking about someone seems to be doing some building work I'm sorry if you hear that background noise uh, I was exactly thinking about Ukrainians because obviously Ukrainians have like quite a lot of mobility inside the European Union unlike um, other displaced people so it's interesting and it, and it totally makes sense my other question is about the academic advising like what I mean because this is something that, that that we think about a lot in our work sometimes students they have really um, and totally understandable and justifiable desires to for example take a literature course or something like this which uh, or like something in the humanities which we would which as a if someone was a high school leaving student who was a, you know a local eu citizen no one would say oh don't don't do that that's that's interesting follow your dream follow your passion or whatever but sometimes some people have a strong passion for something which may not uh lead to um better employment shall we say like you know like we can we can, you know like you get a degree in I don't know like German history or something it may not lead to any sort of employment and I wonder like when it comes to the advice how much do you follow what the students want to do in terms of their desires or or, or dreams shall we say and how much of it is practical saying well you know what here's the here's the economic situation right now in Germany like it's great that you want to study this or that and so on but if you have a degree in something which is more practical and then what if, if the advice does go that way like how do you balance these two things you know the sort of practical side along with wanting to give people the same opportunities as if they weren't in a refugee like situation hope my um, question makes sense yeah yeah um well of course um these considerations play a role and that's one of the that's something also we do in the academic advising like trying to um trying to put the arguments on the table and then or the yeah like um try to see the whole situation of someone what you explained the the example you have given hardly ever happens um because most refugees at least i talked with do have a strong focus on okay i have to do something quickly um i lost a lot of time already my family is waiting for me to to present some achievements i have to um, be in the labor market quickly and then what happens is that they might make quick choices for things that they didn't thought through and that might not also make sense um finally it's their decision so i'm not deciding for someone um my job is just to provide the information maybe to put the information into context and to um kind of discuss um these things with um with a person but if somebody says i have a strong desire in um, german literature why not um and also um and i would never i i don't know so the labor market is good so why not um it's 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 really depending on the individual situation and what and what, on what somebody wants um and my experience is more that people do not focus that much on self fulfillment rather than okay i heard it's i heard i have to do uh, computer science because then i get a good job and it's not that easy either so um like if you especially um if you study at the university in germany the the system um very much focuses on self-reliance um you have to organize yourself you have to um yeah you have to have a lot of motivation um and if you just pick something because you heard that somebody told you you will get a good job afterwards it also doesn't make sense so um yeah so that's kind of you have to balance that but finally people decide for themselves it's not me so yeah Thank you, Katharina. Um, if there are more questions about this topic, we can discuss at the end of the webinar. 